Welcome to Introduction to Oceanography. Of course, Introduction from Oceanography being taught from the textbook from Cengage Learning, Essentials of Oceanography, the 8th edition, Tom Garrison and Robert Ellis being the authors of the 8th edition of Essentials of Oceanography. I'm your professor, Dave Cacciarella, and today we're going to talk about two topics. We're going to start with waves and the different types of waves, and then we're going to move from waves to tides, because tides really are the world's longest period wave. So some interesting stuff to talk about that does impact all of us, if we happen to fish or surf or, or go to the beach, just when will high tide be? Waves transmit energy, not water. That's important. Waves do not move water across the ocean. They move energy across the ocean. Ocean waves are orbital, they're almost like circles in which water molecules move in those closed orbits as the wave moves by. Ocean waves are classified by the disturbing force that creates them, the extent to which the disturbing force continues to influence them once they're formed, and by their wavelength. The speed of an ocean wave is proportional to its wavelength, something that's going to be a mathematical part of this uh, chapter. Uh, and it's going to be very interesting to see how wavelength and speed change with ocean waves. And most characteristics of ocean waves depend on the relationship between their wavelength and the depth of the water in which they're traveling. The orbits of water molecules and waves moving through water deeper than half the wavelength are unaffected by the bottom. That means in deep water, waves can be unaffected by the bottom. The wavelength of a tsunami and tides are so great that they're always affected by the bottom. So they're always continue, considered to be uh, in shallow water. And water displacement causes tsunamis and seismic sea waves. That's going to be very important when we talk about uh, earthquakes and what creates tsunamis. Tsunamis literally not noticeable in the ocean, but they rush ashore like a sudden and very high onrushing tide. They are huge shallow water waves and are among the most lethal of our planet's natural phenomena. All right. Ocean waves move energy. Ocean waves do not move water. They move energy. Ocean waves are visual proof of the transmission of energy across the surface of the ocean. To the right, we can see a floating seagull, and it demonstrates the way a wave travels, but the water does not. You can see the wave moves from left to right, and the gull, and the water in which it's resting, revolve literally in a circle, moving slightly to the left, up the front of the approaching wave, then to the crust, and then sliding to the right down the back of the wave. And we can see how that works in this illustration below. There's no mass transport of the, of, uh, well, there's no mass transport. Nothing moves. The water doesn't move. The energy moves through the water. Um, and so in the actual wave, there is this very small amount of movement, which is known as Stokes drift. And that is the, the amount of transport that actually happens in an actual ocean wave. So in reality, there's a small net movement forward, and that's known as Stokes drift, and this contributes to the motion of wind-driven surface currents. The height, then, is between the top of the crust and the base of the trough. That's going to be the height. Now, the frequency is the number of wave crests, crest 1, crest 2, passing point A or B each second. So for every crest that passes by per second, that's the frequency. The period is the time required for a wave crust at point A here to reach point B. And again, this is the orbital path of the individual water molecule underwater. So orbital waves are waves in which the particles of water move in closed circles as the water passes. Note that the water molecules in the crest of the wave move in the same direction as the wave, but molecules in the trough move in the opposite direction. But they also move more slowly. And the reason, and the fact that they move more slowly is why you have uh, that orbital drift or that Stokes drift. How do we classify waves? Scientists always want to classify natural phenomena, so we're going to classify waves. We have uh, the wave type, the disturbing force, the restoring force, and then the typical wavelength. So we're going to classify the wave type as capillary waves, wind waves, a seash, a seismic sea wave, or a tsunami, or a tide. And the disturbing force of a capillary wave is wind, Disturbing force also of a wind wave is wind. A seash is a change in atmospheric pressure, or um, which could also be storm surge. A seismic sea wave is faulting of the seafloor, a volcanic eruption, or a landslide. And the disturbing force of all tides is the gravitational attraction of the Earth, Sun, and Moon, and the rotation of the Earth. Now, 
what causes waves to, so that's what disturbs waves, these, these issues, what causes waves to go back to where they were. Uh, capillary waves, little tiny waves, the cohesion of water mo molecules can actually bring them back down to flat. And all other waves, it's the restoring force is gravity. Now, the typical wavelength of capillary waves is, is just very, very small, just over half of an inch. The typical wavelength of a wind wave is anywhere between 200 and 500 feet. Uh, and then a siege is going to be uh, much larger and variable as a function of the ocean basin. A seismic sea wave can have a wavelength. That means the, dif the distance between crests of a tsunami could be as much as 125 miles. Uh, and then the, this, the uh, wavelength of, of a tide is half the Earth's circumference. So ocean waves are classified by the disturbing force that creates them, the extent to which the disturbing force continues to influence the wave once it's formed, and the restoring force that tries to flatten them. So the disturbing force um, creates the wave and continues to influence the wave, and the restoring force is the force that tries to flatten them. And the third way that they're going to be classified is by wavelength. Free waves propagate across the ocean without further influence of the disturbing force. So a free wave is going to be disturbed by wind and then continue to move across the ocean. And most wind waves are free waves. Force waves are maintained by the disturbing force. So tides are considered to be forced waves. And a, a restoring force is the dominant force that returns the surface to flatness after the wave is formed. Waves continue after they form because the restoring force overcompensates and creates an oscillation. So a wave, once it leaves its disturbing force, continues because the restoring force tends to create overcompensation, meaning it may pull the wave down to the surface level, but it also pulls it below the surface level, and so it responds by going up above the surface level. So um, waves that continue after they form, free waves, do so because the restoring force open, op overcompensates and creates an oscillation. All right, so this is how your typical wind wave, and so this is gonna be a capillary wave, very, very small. Wind waves are formed by the transfer of wind energy into the water. Wind waves grow from capillary waves. So all wind waves start as capillary waves. Capillary wave forms as wind friction. Literally, the friction between the wind and the surface of the water stretches the water and the surface tension tries to restore the water to smoothness. So the wind stretches the water out and surface tension tries to pull it back. The capillary wave interrupts the smooth sea surface, deflecting surface wind upward, slowing it and causing some of the wind's energy to be transferred into the water to drive the capillary wave crest forward. Essentially, the wave blows across flat water, stretches it, pulls it up and creates this very tiny capillary wave. The increasing energy in the water surface expands the orbital of, uh, orbits of water particles moving in the direction of the wind and enlarges the wave size. So once the capillary wave is formed, this tiny wave, continued wind blowing into the back of the capillary wave um, expands the orbits of the water particles moving in the direction of the wind and enlarges the wave size. So, this is what it looks like with capillary waves, with the wind stretching the water, the surface cohesion of the wave of the water that is trying to pull it back to flatness, uh, and you're getting the capillary waves. Continued wind blowing in the back of the capillary waves causes those waves to continue, and eventually the, the restoring force, gravity, pulls the water down below the surface, and then it comes back up, and you get the free wave that, that continues. So, Capillary waves become gravity waves as their wavelength exceeds 1.74 centimeters. So once it gets above 1.74 centimeters, then you have these gravity waves, these, these free waves. Wind-induced gravity waves, or wind waves, continue to grow as long as the wind above them exceeds their speed. So if the wind is blowing faster than the speed of the wave, the wave will continue to get bigger. Now, wind waves will exhibit a maximum 1 to 7 ratio of wave height to wave length. So this is the wave height from the trough to the crest. This is the wave length from one trough to the other. Wind waves exhibit a maximum 1 to 7 ratio. The angle of the crest will not exceed this 120 degree angle. A peaked appearance indicates a continuous injection of wind energy. If a wave becomes higher than the 1 to 7 ratio, it will break and that's where you get white caps. So winds will look like these peaks in the water until you get to this greater than one to seven ratio, and then you'll start to get white caps 
uh, and that occurs in what is known as fully developed seas. So, wind speed, the wind must be moving faster than the wave crest for energy, to tr energy transfer to continue. So these are the wave or the wind wave development factors. The wind speed must be moving faster than the wave for the energy transfer to continue. Wind duration, winds that blow for a short time will not generate large waves. Winds that blow for a long time, however, will generate large waves. Fetch is the uninterrupted distance over which the wind blows without changing direction. So if the wind is blowing a straight line over a great distance, that's a long fetch of wind, and that's more likely to develop larger waves. And so this concept of a fully developed sea is the maximum wave height theoretically possible for a wind at a specific strength, duration, and fetch. A strong wind must blow continuously in one direction for nearly three days for fully developed seas to occur. Longer exposure will not increase the wave height as the wave energy is lost to the breaking wave top. So this idea of fully developed seas, the biggest wind wave you can have from a type of wind is a function, again, of the wind blowing across a, a specific stretch of ocean for a specific period of time, and a fully developed sea typically takes three days to form. So the fetch of the uninterrupted distance over which the wind blows without significant change in direction. The fetch is that uninterrupted distance. This is the fetch of the wave from the, where the wind's blowing all the way to where it's no longer blowing. Wave size increases with increased wave, wind speed. The faster the wind, the larger the wave. Increased duration of wind, the longer it blows. And the fetch, the length of, uh, of uh, distance, that is, that the wind blows over. A strong wind must blow continuously in one direction for nearly three days for the largest wind waves to develop and to fully develop seas. All right, larger swell move faster. So this is going to be an interesting look at wave trains and how waves move through the open ocean. Wave separation or dispersion is a function of wavelength. Waves with lo the longest wave length move the fastest and leave the area of wave formation sooner. So longer wavelength waves will move away from the area of the disturbing force more quickly. The smooth undulation of ocean water caused by wave dispersion is called swell. So uh, here at the left, wave, waves travel in groups called wave trains. So one through five, one through six, one through seven, one through, th those are wave trains, okay? As the leading wave of the group travels forward, it transferred half of its, of its energy forward to initiate motion in the undisturbed surface ahead. So as the leading wave moves along, it transfers energy forward and causes a wave ahead of it. The leading wave in the wave train continuously disappears while a new wave is continuously formed at the back of the train. In this case, we have five, and then six is formed, and then seven is formed, and then eight is formed. The wave train travels at about half the speed of any individual wave. And so that speed of the wave train is known as group velocity. So how do waves behave in different water depth? Again, if you take the wavelength L and divide it by 2, that is the depth in which wave motion or orbital motion stops. So there's no perceptible motion underneath this depth. So as the wave moves into shallower and shallower water, um, you begin to lose that depth and it starts to impact the behavior of the wave. So ocean waves and how they act depends on the relationship between the wavelength and the water depth. Wavelength determines the size of the orbits, but water depth determines the shape. So how big these orbits are are a function of the wavelength, with the longer wavelength having much larger orbits. They are nearly circular in open water, but once they get into a depth that's half their wavelength, those orbits begin to flatten out. So a wave cannot feel the bottom, meaning these, these waves are not feeling the bottom until the water is half the wavelength. So out here in the deeper water, they don't feel the bottom. Once they get into the shallower water, they begin to feel the bottom. When the water depth is half the wavelength, the orbits are flattened out and they become transitional waves. When the water is less than 1 of the wavelength, it's considered a shallow water wave, and that's typically where you start to see 
these breaking waves. In general, the longer the wavelength, the faster the wave energy moves through the water. As water depth decreases, a wave can begin to feel the bottom, and then the wave speed slows. And what ends up happening is, because the wave speed slows, as these waves here feel the bottom, the wavelength between the wave also shortens as the wave approaches shore. So deep water wave speed is proportional to the wavelength, and shallow water wave speed is proportional to the depth. Again, the speed of these deep water waves has to do with the wavelength. The speed of these shallow water waves has to do with the water depth. Wave period does not change as water depth changes, so wavelengths shorten. Waves bunch up as the depth increases. So deep water waves change into shallow water waves. These are the events that lead the wave to break. First, the wave feels the bottom when the water depth is less than one half the wavelength. Second, the circular motion of the water molecules in the wave is then interrupted. Wavelength decreases, but the period remains the same. That was the last point of the previous slide. The period, the number of wave crests that pass a point remains the same, but the wavelength decreases. Waves become too high for the wavelength, meaning the top of the wave becomes too high, and the crest will move ahead of its supporting base, causing the wave to break. So here that is uh, graphically illustrated. The swell feels the bottom when the water is shallower than half the wavelength. So here it's half the wavelength, and, and the wave begins to feel the bottom. The wave crest becomes peaked because the wave's energy is packed into less water depth. So it pushes it up and it becomes peaked. These orbitals become more elliptical. Constrained, uh, constraint of circular wave motion by interaction with the ocean floor slows the wave. It slows down while the wave behind it maintains the original speed. Therefore, the wavelength has to shorten. The distance between the waves becomes shorter. That's like when you're standing in the surf zone, the waves are closer together than they are out in the open ocean. The period remains unchanged. The number of waves that will pass a certain point at a time remains the same, but the distance between them shortens up. At four, the wave approaches the critical one to seven ratio of wave height to wave length. When it passes that ratio, the top of the wave literally continues moving faster than the bottom of the wave. So at five, the wave breaks and the ratio of wave height the water depth is about three to four. The movement of the water particles is shown in, in red here. Note the change from a deep water wave through the transitional wave stage to a shallow water. So here it's a circle, here it's an elliptical, and here the water is literally moving back and forth after that water breaks. And this is after that wave breaks, and this is known as the surf zone. So two different types of waves. Um, waves that we typically see here in Florida are spilling waves. They just sort of crumble over one another. And then we have plunging waves, the waves that sort of pitch out uh, and create, uh, well, the tube, as surfers call it, or sort of pitch out and are more hollow. So plunging waves will break violently against the shore, leaving an air-filled tube, the tube that surfers talk about, or a channel between the crest and the foot of the wave. Plunging waves are formed when waves approach a shore over a steeply sloped bottom. So essentially... The plunging wave is this. It, so if this is, if I can draw this for you, if this is the bottom, as the wave comes in like this, if it's if it's steeply sloped, the wave top of the wave gets thrown out while the bottom of the wave literally stops, and you get that plunging wave. Not the greatest picture in the world, but you get that plunging wave. That's the two. Okay, if you have a a, a shallow slope, it's a more gradual slope. It's a more gradual slope like this, then those waves will tend to crest and they'll just sort of crumble down. And that's kind of what we see here in Florida where the, where the wave, it doesn't plunge, it just sort of spills over and crumbles down. So spilling waves occur on gradually sloping ocean bottoms. The crest of the spilling wave slides down the face of the wave as it breaks on shore. All right, well, where would you typically find the biggest waves? You'd find them where you had the highest winds. And you have the highest winds where you have the mid-latitude Westerlies moving across the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean, and then very specifically, the Westerlies moving across the Southern Pacific, uh, the Southern Indian Ocean, and even to a lesser degree, the Southern Atlantic Ocean, because 
the southern oceans, the winds are not impeded by land. There's a lot of open ocean. The winds are only slightly impeded by land here, not impeded by land. And so your highest winds are across this section of uh, the, uh, the southern ocean. And it's that section of the southern ocean where you do see those, uh, those wave heights up to five to six meters. So uh, in this image, the highest waves occur in the southern ocean where the waves are more than six meters, 20 feet or so high. The lowest waves are found in the tropics. Remember, the tropics are where we have the doldrums. These are the, um, where not much happens. There's not a whole lot of wind, and therefore there's not a whole lot of waves. What happens when waves from different storm systems exist simultaneously? So if you think about the open ocean, you might have wind coming from the northern Atlantic Ocean, maybe some wind coming from a tropical system uh, down closer to the, uh, the Caribbean. And all these different winds will likely generate different types of, uh, of wind waves. So what happens when different waves from different storm systems interact. Well, when they meet, they interfere with one another. And there's two types of interference, destructive and constructive. And so destructive interference is when two waves that actually cancel each other out, resulting in a reduced or no wave at all. So two waves can come at each other from two different directions and really serve to cancel themselves out. More often, we see constructive interference where there's additive interferences where the waves actually add to uh, each other and that results in waves that are larger than the original waves. But it's going to be a combination of both depending on how and what angles the winds and the waves meet at. And so what you get is this, uh, this offset of lots of different size waves moving through the same region and that cycle of larger and smaller waves uh, that we hear in the breaking surf is what's known as the surf beat. So surf beat is not just a type of music but it's actually a scientific term referring to the cycle of a set of larger breaking waves followed by a lull in the surf and then smaller breaking waves. Now, if you have lots of constructive interference, you can get these freak waves that, uh, that occur that become gigantic, and uh, those are rogue waves. Uh, and that is when you get a wave uh, that the crest is higher than the theoretical maximum of those waves. And you mainly see that again down in the Southern Ocean. So, uh, constructive interference and destructive interference. Two overlapping waves of different wavelengths are shown, one in blue and one in green. If both are presented in the ocean at the same time, they'll interfere with each other to form a composite wave. So the composite wave is actually the one that's going to be uh, in green here, the two different waves uh, in red. So the different waves have essentially different wavelengths. So there are periods of time when they're synced together and they have constructive waves and periods of time when they're, they're, they're synced apart and you create destructive interference. And so you get additive situations here and then destructive situations here. At the position of line one, the two waves um, will constructively interfere with each other to form large crests and troughs. And then at B, at the position of line two, the two waves will destructively interfere and the crests and troughs will be uh, much smaller. So that's the result of both constructive and destructive interference. So here's a sea level trace uh, at this oil platform in the North Sea back in 1995 where constructive interference was responsible for uh, a wave of almost 19 meters. So we're talking 55 to 60 feet. Uh, and you can see you had a pretty typical surf beat with some constructive interference and then destructive interference uh, somewhere in between. And then some constructive interference created this, tr this tremendous peak of this wave. And that's one of those rogue waves. Three things that happen to waves, particularly as they approach the shore, refraction, diffraction, and reflection. Wave refraction, the slowing and bending of waves in shallow water, wave refraction occurs because waves usually approach shore at an angle. The part of the wave line closest to the shore slows down as it can feel the bottom. The part of the wave further out moves faster, so it catches up to and passes the part of the wave line in the shallower water and that causes the wave to bend or to refract. Defraction is when a wave literally propagates around an obstacle essentially for the same reason. A straight wave hits an obstacle at the center of the wave where it hits the obstacle the water is shallower and it causes the wave to literally bend around that obstacle and that is defraction. And you also see reflection when a wave bounces back from an obstacle that it encounters. Reflective waves can cause interference with oncoming waves and create standing waves. Think about the last time you were at the ocean when the wave rolled up the seashore and then rolled back down. Sometimes it creates a little standing wave in just an inch or two of water. That is interference creating that standing wave. So this is what that looks like. The wave progression is coming in at this angle. So this is the shoreline down here. 
And this is the angle. You got a nice, let's say this is a shore facing east, a nice north wind blowing a northeast wind swell in. This wave propagates along at the same speed. Again, once the wave begins to feel the bottom, where it is the depth is half the wavelength, uh, then the wavelength begins to shorten and the wave starts to slow down. But these waves are moving at the same speed, and it literally causes these waves to bend and also causes them to essentially come in almost straight parallel to the coastline. So that's what we typically see at the beach as, winds come, as waves coming straight in because as they felt the bottom, they will begin to bend and straighten out. And so where you get waves coming in at a sharp angle to the beach is where the wa water depth is deep and then becomes shallow very abruptly. Here on, in the Atlantic Ocean on the east coast of Florida, the ocean bottom gradually slopes out and so you have this enough time for these waves to literally refract and then come in straight to shore. But this is refraction. Here the water's deeper, here it's shallower. Where it's shallower the wave moves slowly and the wavelength decreases. Here the wavelength is the same and the wave is moving more quickly and it causes the wave to bend, to refract as it approaches shore. And you can see that refraction as it comes along the shoreline. Here the waves are coming in. This is the angle they're moving and as they come along the shoreline, they refract and bend into the shoreline where, in most cases, they're almost coming in parallel to the shore uh, in every location. So wave refraction, again, a wave's coming in at this angle here, and they refract and bend in, uh, so they're coming almost straight into the ocean. And, and here's that, that uh, the, the dif diffraction. When the waves are coming in straight here, as they hit this little island and get shallower, the waves begin to slow down, and so they they bend around just like the were if it was just a straight coastline and then over here you get this constructive and destructive interference so wave diffraction past an island chain polynesian navigators use diffraction patterns to sense the presence of islands uh, out of sight uh, from the horizon so if you were a canoe coming along this way and you didn't see this island uh, you would get this constructive interference and you know that somewhere off in the distance there was an island. So that is going to be your defraction and your refraction. And then again, uh, you also have um, uh, the, uh, the reflection. So storm surge is an abrupt bulge of water. So it's kind of like a wave, but it's a bulge of water driven onshore by a tropical cyclone, hurricane, or frontal storm. So it's created by sustained onshore winds. The storm motion and the wind motion is in this direction, coming from offshore to onshore and it literally pushes up a mound of water. Now, there was a time when we thought that the low pressure of the hurricane may have lifted up that mound, but we now know that pressure-driven storm surge is only about 5% of the total. All the rest of it is wind blowing that water and causing it to pile up. Strong onshore winds have a component in storm surge as they cause winds to pile up ahead of the driving wind. Um, they can be very short-lived, but they can be up to, so 7.5 meters, we're talking 20 to 25 feet, it can raise the level of the ocean. So this mound is almost like a tide coming in and raising the level of the ocean because the breaking waves caused by this wind literally break on top of the storm surge. So storm surge consists of only a crust, so they really can't be assigned a wavelength or a period, not really called a wave either, but it definitely brings the water up and causes serious damage. As a matter of fact, most of the damage from hurricanes uh, and deaths from hurricanes is caused by uh, the storm surge. Standing waves, uh, water rocking back and forth at a specific frequency in a confined area is called a siege, and it's also known as a standing wave. Now you can get standing waves uh, in rivers uh, where the, the water is moving along and for some reason it gets diffracted off of, it, off of an obstacle, and uh, not diffracted, but reflected off of an obstacle and moves back down. You can also get uh, a standing wave in the situation uh, where you have the ocean wave moving up the seashore. So I'll try and draw a couple of these for you. Um, if this is your seashore and your and your wave is moving up it and it gets to a point where it stops and then moves back down, this motion back down can create a standing wave right here where there's water motion in and there's water motion out and you get the standing wave. You can also get that in a river situation where the river is flowing along like this but some obstacle, maybe there's a boulder here, uh, causes water to, to bounce back off. And again, you'll get that standing wave in one spot. So that's what, that's what standing waves are. But we also have um, these, these standing waves that happen in enclosed basins. So maybe this is a lake or a, a tidal basin, but it's going to be an enclosed basin. 
and water is going to oscillate back and forth in this closed basin and essentially is a standing wave where the water goes up and down and up and down. So water rocking back and forth at a specific frequency in a confined area is called a siege. A siege is also known as a standing wave, a wave that oscillates vertically with no forward movement. Just like the waves I just drew for you, they go up and down but they have no forward movement. The node is the position of a standing wave where water actually moves sideways but not, does not rise or fall. So this is a standing wave uh, going through its whole sequence from 1 to 5 and then uh, back to 2 again. So it just is up and down, up and down motion but no back and forth motion. So water can rock back and forth in a confined basin and, uh, and this happens sometimes in the Great Lakes where at one side of the Great Lake you have high water and at the other side of the Great Lake you have uh, very low water and so that's an example of that standing wave. The Great Lake represents the standing basin but wind blowing over that Great Lake for a long period of time can create a wave where water pushes to one side and then essentially sloshes back to the other side. Tsunamis and seismic sea waves. Tsunamis are very very long wavelength shallow water, shallow because their wavelength is so long they're essentially always in shallow water even in the deep ocean. They're progressive waves caused by the rapid displacement of ocean water. Tsunamis are essentially created by the vertical movement of Earth along faults. And they're called seismic sea waves. So this is, this is your ocean basin, that's the surface, this is the sea bottom, and there's a fault along that sea bottom right here. And the pressure of that fault is pushing this part of the rock up and this part of the rock down. Maybe it's a convergent fault boundary. So over many, 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 many thousands of years, just pressure builds up, pressure builds up, and then suddenly one day, this fault gets forced up, and the sea bottom actually gets pushed up. So it looks something like this. Well, it displaces all of this water, and all that water gets pushed up, and that, that displacement of water causes your tsunami, your initial tsunami to form, and then propagate away. Now, they will also back up a smaller wave, but the major tsunami is going to move uh, in that direction. So um, a seismic sea wave or a tsunami is generated by the vertical movement of Earth along faults and they are seismic sea waves. Tsunamis are always shallow water waves because they're extremely long wavelengths um, and uh, you can also get a tsunami generated by a landslide so a lot of earth coming down the side of a mountain into the ocean, icebergs calving uh, when icebergs are part of the ice sheet and they, they, they uh, fall off uh, into the water, it's called calving, so icebergs falling from glaciers, volcanic eruptions, asteroid impacts, any direct displacement of water uh, will cause a tsunami and, and they are devastating, much like storm surge, they create uh, you know, most of the deaths that you would attribute to ocean waves. Most recently we had the uh, Indian Ocean tsunami from an earthquake uh, back in December of 2004 and it was exactly the situation I showed you, we had a convergent plate boundary uh, where the, uh, the, the this plate was moving up uh, into this plate and once it was forced under it, here, and here's the fault, it, it pushed this land up and it created that, that ocean wave. Now the main wave moved away but also the tsunami moved toward, toward land. So it happened just offshore of Jakarta and so this wave washed up in Jakarta creating a tsunami there. So the Great Indian Ocean Tsunami, 26 December 2004, uh, began when a rupture along a plate junction lifted the sea surface about 10 meters. Gravity, so, so the first thing that happens is the sea, it gets lifted up. So that's the, 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 um, the disturbing force. What's the restoring, the restoring force? Gravity is the restoring force. So it pulls it back down, but it doesn't necessarily pull it just back down to sea level. Gravity pulled it further down than sea level, and so that it needed to be restored back up, and it went up beyond sea level, and then back down, and then back up, and then back down. And so that's how this displacement of water creates a wave. Gravity pulled the crust down, overshooting sea level, and creating a trough. The oscillating ocean forced a progressive wave that radiated from the epicenter in all directions. The wave moved outward at, this is astonishing, 472 miles per hour. That's how quickly it moved across the ocean because of the tremendously long wavelength. At this speed it took about 15 minutes to reach Sumatra and about 28 minutes uh, to get across the, uh, the Indian Ocean. And so this is a very classic scenario of a tsunami. Same thing happened uh, in Haiti with an offshore earthquake causing the displacement of the ocean and a tsunami radiated away from that area. All right, because tsunamis have extremely long wavelengths, they're always in shallow waters and always behave as shallow water waves. The tsunami is always in contact with the ocean floor and sometimes it's actually guided and refracted by the uh, seafloor topography. 
So the speed of the tsunami can be calculated using the same formula as for other shallow water waves, which that speed is the square root of, uh, of gravity times the depth. Um, so C equals the square root of gravity times the depth, the average speed of about 470 miles per hour. So your gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared, uh, and the depth of the Pacific Abyssal uh, area is about 4,600 meters. So you multiply those two things together and take the square root, and you get that average speed of a tsunami of 212 meters per second, or 470 miles per hour. So here is uh, the wave height, again, um, from the uh, tsunami that happened, well, the earthquake that happened just off um, Japan with the, uh, the disaster with the nuclear power plant and the tsunami that radiated, radiated away from it um, because of that earthquake. So that's Japan, the Lucian Islands, and the west coast of the United States. And that's what it looked like in terms of travel times how long it took that ocean wave, that, that uh, shallow water wave, that tsunami wave, to reach even as far south and, uh, and east as the south coast of, of uh, South America. It took just under a day. And today we are talking about tides, and tides are actually uh, waves. They are forced waves. They are forced by gravity and inertia, and uh, they are the, uh, the waves on the planet that have the longest wavelength. And they are essentially short-term changes in ocean surface height. The equilibrium theory of tides explains tides by examining the balance of and effects of forces that allow our planet to stay in orbit around the sun or the moon to the orbit the earth. Because of the nearness to earth, our moon actually has a greater influence in our tides than the sun. So the equilibrium theory basically is looking at the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon to explain tides. The dynamic theory takes into account those items, but also seabed contour, water viscosity, and inertia. Together, the equilibrium and dynamic theories allow tides to be predicted, uh, not only for tomorrow, but uh, actually years in advance. And one of the great things about tides, other than knowing when high and low tide will be, uh, to know when the, the best surf is going to be, you can also extract power from tidal flow. All right, so tides are the longest of all ocean waves. Periodic, short-term changes in the height of the ocean surface at a particular place caused by the gravitational force of the moon and sun and the motion of the earth. The wavelength of tides can be half the circumference of earth and are the longest of all waves. Tides are considered forced waves because they are never free from the forces that cause them, specifically never free from gravity. The equilibrium theory of tides explains many characteristics of ocean tides. The ocean surface is presumed always to be in equilibrium, that is, in balance with the forces that are acting upon it. And the dynamic theory of tides explains the characteristics of ocean tides based on the gravity of the sun and the moon and the characteristics of fluid motion and also the seabed in the shape of ocean basins and the shape of the basins that tides are acting in. So the equilibrium theory, again, basically is looking at the gravitational forces playing to force the waves. The dynamic theory takes into all the other subtler aspects. And that dynamic theory makes tide calculations a very complex thing. It's not a, it's not a simple thing at all. Very, very complex formulas go into it. But once those formulas are solved, we essentially can know the tides for years into the future. Gravity, as we know, holds bodies together. A planet orbits the sun in balance between gravity and inertia. If the planet is not moving, gravity will pull it into the sun. If the planet is moving, the inertia of the planet will keep it moving in a straight line. In a stable orbit, gravity and inertia are in balance and cause a planet to travel in a fixed path around the sun. So, A, you have a non-moving planet being pulled toward the sun, and B, you have a planet that is moving in a direction in a straight line. And of course, remember that um, uh, bodies tend to move in a straight line unless another force of acceleration acts upon them. And so the gravity is that other force causing the, um, the motion of the planet to be in, not necessarily a circle, but more like an ellipse around the sun. So the pull of gravity between two bodies is proportional. Now this is what the force of gravity is. Pull of gravity is proportional to the masses of the bodies, that's m1 and m2, but it is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Uh, hence, heavier objects generate more gravity, and the further the di distance between two objects, 
the less gravity there's going to be. Heavy bodies are attracted more strongly than bodies, uh, and bodies close together are attracted more strongly. So tides, again, are forced waves formed by gravity and inertia. Tides are caused by the gravitational force of the moon and the sun, and even though the sun is 27 million times as massive as the moon, its great distance from the earth means that its influence on our tides is about 46% of the moon's influence on our tides. That doesn't mean the moon exerts 54% and the the sun exerts 46%, that means the, the uh, power that's exerted by the moon, the sun's influence is only 46% of that. Newton's gravitational model to describe the Earth's tides is known as the equilibrium theory and mainly considers the attractions of Earth, moon, and sun while giving some consideration to ocean depth or the position of continents. The modification to the equilibrium theory is that dynamic theory, which does take into account the wavelength of the wave, the water depth relationships, the positions of the continents, ocean basins, the density of water, the seafloor topography, or what's known as bathymetry, and lots of other very subtle effects that change how tides work in different basins. The movement of the moon generates what's known as strong tractive forces. So in this example, we see the distance between the Earth and the moon and the mass of the Earth being 81 times the mass of the Moon. And what we know then is that the pivot point around which both the Earth and the Moon spin is this point just inside the Earth's surface. So the Moon does not rotate around the center of Earth. The Earth and the Moon together create the Earth-Moon system and they rotate around a common center. So the the this common center is that, uh, the common center of mass is that point about a thousand miles beneath the Earth's surface. That's where that fulcrum of that, uh, of that lever is. Uh, they're just about a thousand miles inside the Earth's surface. So the combination of the outward force of inertia, remember the moon is moving in a straight line, and the inward force of gravity are known as uh, the attractive forces. So we can see that the average Earth-Moon distance goes from the center of the Earth to the center of the moon, um, but because the Earth is so much more massive than the Moon, the point at which the two revolve around each other is actually inside the Earth's surface. So the Moon's gravity attracts the ocean toward it. The motion of the Earth around the center of mass of the Earth-Moon system throws up a bulge on the side of Earth opposite of the Moon. The combination of the two effects creates two tidal bulges. So in the first illustration, you can see where the, the attractive force of the moon, the gravity of the moon, literally pulls the ocean surface toward it, and it creates a bulge on that side of the Earth. The Earth spinning around that center of mass of the Earth-Moon system then forces an opposing bulge on the opposite side of the Earth. It's the, it's the motion around that center. It's moving around that center, and that creates that opposite or that opposing bulge. And the combination is... At any, any given moment, you have a bulge created by the gravity of the moon, essentially pointing toward the moon, and on the opposite side of the Earth, you have a bulge in the sea surface. This, is, this bulge represents the sea surface. Without the moon, the sea surface would be flat around the Earth. With the moon, as you see in the left illustration, there's a bulge toward the moon because of the motion of the Earth in the Earth-Moon system. There's a bulge away from the moon, and the combined result is this bulge in the sea surface pointing toward the moon and pointing away from the moon. Those are the high tides. The center of that bulge is the high tide. And as you know, the Earth revolves on its axis. It spins on its axis. And it's that spinning on its axis that then causes any given beach to go from high tide to low tide, back to high tide to low tide. So here's a, a very detailed explanation of this. And you should take a few moments, maybe pause the video, uh, and, and read some of the very specifics about this, where you have different forces at different points on the Earth, a force is created by inertia, um, forces created by gravity, attractive forces, um, and then how they all sort of balance together. In the end, um, the two forces that move the ocean, which is one is inertia, the inertia on the planet's surface because of our motion around the Earth-Moon system, and the gravitational attraction of the Moon, they are precisely equal in strength, but they are opposite in direction. So that inertia 
and the gravitational tr attraction to the moon is the same, but just in opposite directions. And so they balance, but they only really balance at the center of the Earth. That's the, uh, the center there, the CE point. The action of gravity and inertia on particles at five different locations on Earth are shown here. So we see it at one, two, three, four, and then on five. At points one and two, the gravitational attraction of the moon slightly exceeds uh, the gravitational attraction then slightly exceeds the outward moving tendency of inertia. The imbalance of forces causes water to move along the Earth's surface, converging at a point toward the Moon. At 3 and 4, inertia exceeds the gravitational force, so water moves along the Earth's surface and converges at a point opposite the Moon. So it is that motion of the water along the Earth's surface, because on the side closest to the Moon, the gravitational attraction exceeds inertia, and on the side away from the moon, inertia exceeds gravitational attraction that causes the water to move along the Earth's surface and then bulge up there right in the center. And so again, you get a bulge toward the moon and a bulge opposite the moon, and the Earth, of course, is re revolving underneath that bulge, and that is how we go from high tide to low tide. So the movement of the moon generates those strong tractive forces. The water bulge resulting from inertia is on the back side of the Earth, okay, and the water bulge resulting from gravitation is on the front side of the Earth. There is not a point on the Earth where the tractive forces are in equilibrium, only at the center of the Earth, okay? On the surface of the Earth, they're not. So the net tractive forces on the surface cause, causes the water to move toward those bulges, one pointing toward the Moon and one pointing away from the Moon, and again, looking at the Earth and from the side, North Pole to South Pole, the movement of the planet from the west to the east, the spinning of the, the, the Earth counterclockwise as you look down on top of it means that at one point you're going to be under low tide and at another point you're going to be under high tide. The bulges stay aligned, okay, the bulges stay aligned. The Earth-Moon system doesn't change dramatically over the course of 24 hours. It does. The, the Moon takes 28 and a half days to get around the Earth, so there is some movement of the of the moon along its path around the Earth, but in a given 24-hour period, um, it's, 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 it's nominal. And so that bulge essentially stays put. So the bulge stays aligned as the Earth spins on its axis. Earth's rotation beneath the tidal bulges produces high tides and low tides. And we can see, if we look at this, that the tidal cycle is about 24 hours and 50 minutes long. That's because the moon is going to come up about 50 minutes later each day because of its trip around the Earth every month or so, a little bit less than a month. And so it doesn't come up at the same time, it comes up a little bit later, and because of that, the tides change by anywhere between 50 and 40 to maybe 60 minutes a day, depending on which basin you're in. And again, we're looking down on the Earth. The Earth turns eastward, west to east, underneath the tidal bulges, and at one point, at 6.13 in the morning, you have high tide, and then at 12.26 you have low tide, and that's as that, that island that's showing in this illustration spins through that tidal bulge. The bulge isn't moving, the bulge is fixed. The Earth itself spins through that bulge. A lunar day is the time that elapses between the time the moon is highest in the sky and the next time it is highest in the sky. In a 24-hour solar day, the moon moves eastward by about 12.2 degrees. So Earth must rotate another 12.2 degrees, or about 50 minutes, to again place the moon at its highest position overhead. So a lunar day is 24 hours and 50 minutes long. Because Earth must turn an additional 50 minutes for the same tidal alignment, Lunar tides usually arrive about 50 minutes later each day. Now again, the dynamic theory tells us that there's other factors involved that change that. So it's not always exactly 50 minutes, but it's about 50 minutes later each day. Lunar tides are tides caused by the gravitational and, inertial, and inertia interactions of the Moon and the Earth. And so there's the Moon directly overhead at the start, and then as you go around one solar day, the Moon has moved 12.2 degrees, and so you, got, you have to travel another 50 minutes to catch up to it. And that's why the tides aren't exactly aligned every day. That's why they're about 50 minutes later each day. So those tidal bulges will follow the moon. So the tidal bulge will move again with the moon, and why? 
Our tides are different every day. The moon does not always stay directly above the equator, and tidal bulges follow the moon. So not only is the moon moving ahead 12.2 degrees each day, it's not always directly aligned with the equator. And because it's not always directly aligned with that equator, that bulge is going to follow the moon. When the moon's position is north of the equator, the gravitational bulge toward the moon is also located north of the equator. And the opposite inertial bulge is below the equator on the opposite side of the Earth. So yes, the sun does also influence the tides. Tides are caused by the gravitational force of the moon and sun, and even though the sun is 27 million times as massive as the moon, its great distance from the earth means that its influence on our tides is only about 46% of the moon's influence on our tides. The sun's attractive forces develop the same way the moon's, but smaller bulges follow the sun through the day. So in reality, it's not just the one bulge of the moon. There's going to be one large bulge on either side of the Earth because of the Moon and because of inertia, but there's also going to be a smaller bulge that is created by the Sun. So the Sun's tractive forces develop in the same way as the Moon, but smaller bulges follow the Sun to the day. Solar tides are caused by the gravitational and inertial forces of the Earth and Sun, very much the same way as with the Moon. Like the Moon, the Sun also moves from its position directly above the equator, although the Sun does it more slowly. So the position of the solar bulge varies just the same way as the position of the lunar bulge. And again, we're talking about that north and south of the equator. At the equinox, or the beginning of um, the fall, or the beginning of spring, the sun is directly over the equator, and that's where the bulge would be. But when we go into the northern hemisphere winter, and we're tilted away from uh, the sun, the bulge is down here over the Tropic of Capricorn, and so that's where the bulge will be. And same thing when we go into our our solstice in June, the sun is directly over the Tropic of Cancer, and that's where the bulge would be. If the sun and the moon are in line with the Earth, then the solar and lunar tides are additive, called spring tides. If the moon and Earth are at a right angle, then the solar tides will diminish, and the lunar tides are called neap tides. So this is re reference to the, the solar tides themselves. So I'll go back and it says, if the sun and the moon are in line, then the, then the solar and lunar tides are additive, and they're called, um, they're called uh, spring tides. And if the Earth and the or is right angle with the moon, and the solar tide will diminish. The solar tide will diminish, uh, and the lunar tide is called an, a neap tide. So that's what this looks like. So when you have a, a new moon, again, so here's the sun shining on the moon, it's shining on this side of the moon, so what we see at night is dark, that's a new moon. And here's the sun shining on the moon, and uh, other than some type of an eclipse, the full half of the moon is going to be illuminated, so that's going to be a full moon. And so, um, when you have a, a, um, the moon on the opposite side, it's going to pull this bulge further out, and you have the, the moon on this side, it's going to pull this bulge further out. When the moon is at that right angle, okay, then the lunar bulge is here, and the lunar bulge is here, and the solar bulge is here, and so you've lessened the tides. In this situation, you're adding the so solar and the lunar, and you're adding the solar and the lunar, and here you're subtracting them. So your high tides are going to be higher during your spring tide, the additive tides, and your low tides are going to be lower. And then here your high tides are not going to be quite as high, but your low tides are going to be a little bit higher. There's going to be a little bit higher low tide as well. So bottom line is, at the new and full moon, the solar and the lunar tides reinforce each other, making spring tides, the highest tides and lowest tides. At the first and third quarters, the sun and the earth and moon form a right angle, creating neap tides, the lowest highs and the highest lows. So it's the lowest highs and the highest lows. Relative position of the sun, moon, and earth during spring and neap tides. You can see that here. All the new and full moons, or I should say at the new and full moons, the solar and lunar tides reinforce each other, making those spring tides. The highest high and the lowest low. The first and third quarter, the moon, the sun, and the earth form a right angle, creating neap tides, the lowest high and the highest low tide. Here you can see the tidal record for two cities, New York City and Port Adelaide, Australia, and the impact of the phases of the moon. Remember, at the new moon and the full moon, the sun and the moon are lined up, and that creates additive tides. So the tides are going to be higher. And then at the quarter, you are going to have lower high tides, but your actual low tides will be higher 
Uh, so there's definite changes between the spring tide and the neap tide, and they all follow the phase of the moon. And again, the moon is not always in the exact same position over the Earth every day. It changes by about 50 minutes. So this all fluctuates uh, with great periodicity, and then you have other factors that determine when high tides and low tides are going to occur. So it's never all exactly the same one day to the next, one month to the next, or one year to the next. The dynamic theory of tides explains the difference between the predictions of the equilibrium theory and the observed tides. So the equilibrium theory would predict one thing. The actual observed tides are something different, and we use the dynamic theory to explain the difference. It recognizes that water covers only three quarters of the planet and is confined to shallow seas and ocean basins that are fixed on the rotating Earth. And it also understands the shape of those basins may induce different types of tidal movements, including seiches, water sloshing back and forth, or circular moving tides. It also takes into account the speed of the long wave tide in relatively shallow waters. Tides are always shallow water waves. They always feel the bottom. So we have different types of tides, three basic different types of tides, semi-diurnal, diurnal, and mixed tides. And so the word diurnal means daily. Uh, you probably are familiar with the idea of something being nocturnal, something that occurs at night. We oftentimes say that cats are nocturnal animals. They do most of their activity at nighttime. Well, diurnal means daily. And so semi-diurnal means twice a day, or you know, half the day, so twice a day. Diurnal means once a day. And then there's mixed tides. So semi-diurnal tides occur twice in a lunar day. It's in a lunar day. Diurnal tides occur once each lunar day, and then mixed tides describe a tidal pattern with significantly different highs and lows through a cycle. Now, within all basins, there's an amphidromic point, or the amphidromic points, which are also known as nodes. So the amphidromic point, or node, is a no-tide point where the water does not change. At the center of ocean basins, this is where the water level does not change. So here is an illustration globally where you have mixed tides like Los Angeles where you have sometimes high, sometimes low, sometimes higher lows, and sometimes lower lows. Diurnal tides, meaning one high and one low, and that you know, typically happens in the Gulf Basin because the water kind of sloshes back and forth. And then what we have along the East Coast and what you can see along a big chunk of the world's coastlines, the semi-diurnal high. The semi-diurnal high where you have uh, one, two high tides and two low tides in any lunar day. So here's the amphidromic circulation. A tide wave crest enters an ocean basin in the northern hemisphere. That is what's happening at A. So a tide wave moves into an ocean basin in the northern hemisphere. The wave trends to the right because of Coriolis effect, causing the high tide on the basin's eastern shore. Unable to continue to the right because of the interference of the shore, the crust then gets deflected northward or to the north and follows the shoreline. That causes a high tide on the basin's northern shore next, then the wave continues its progress around the basin in a counterclockwise rotation, forming a high tide on the western shore third and then completing the circuit. The point at which the crest moves, that point at the center at which the crest moves, is the amphidromic point, or the AP, and that is a point where the water level doesn't change. The tide rotates around that point, and it may be counterintuitive that it rotates counterclockwise because it's being forced to the right or clockwise in the northern hemisphere, but it's not forced at a 90 degree angle. It's forced at about a 45 degree angle. So that wave hits the coast at an angle and is deflected north, and that's why it wraps around the basin counterclockwise. So these are the amphidromic points in all of the world's oceans. And you can see the North Atlantic has one. You have one sort of in the Caribbean. Um, you have one down in the southern parts of the South Atlantic and the Southern Pacific. There's a couple actually in the Pacific Ocean. And each of these amphidromic points are points at which tides rotate around a basin. So tidal ranges generally increasing with increasing distance from the AP. So the further you get away from the amphidromic point, the more you're going to have a range of tides. The colors indicate where tides are most extreme, the highest highs and the lowest lows, with blues being the least extreme and then the reds being the most extreme. And we do have areas where we have extreme high and low tides that are great distances from the APs. 
white lines radiating from the AP indicate tide waves moving around these points. So there's almost a dozen places on the map where the lines converge. Now those are going to be your APs. Notice how at each of these places, the surrounding color, um, the tidal force in that region is blue, indicating there's little or no apparent tide. That's that, that amphidromic node, that point in which there's no tide, the no tide point. These convergent areas are, are called the amphidromic points. Tide waves move around these points clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counter, in, uh, I guess say counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere, and then clockwise in the southern hemisphere. Now I should point out, this, this whole motion around these very specific points is why tides are so different in so many different parts of the world. And these points change over geologic time as our continents and ocean basins slowly change their shape, whether increasing or decreasing in size, or changing their shape in general, these no tide points will change as well. It's just an extremely slow process. So tidal patterns vary with ocean basin shape and size. Experience certainly allows the prediction of tide heights to an accuracy of about an inch, inch two tenths for, for literally years in advance. The tidal range is the height difference between high tides and low tides. Now, in some inlets um, or other enclosed basins, essentially, you get a tidal phenomenon in which the leading edge of the incoming tide literally forms a wave. So the tide is moving in against water. It's coming in an inlet. And so where a tidal bore forms is where the leading edge of the incoming tide literally forms a wave, or in some cases multiple waves of water, that travel up the river or up narrow bays, and they literally travel against the direction of the river or bay's current. Now, we also have unique tides that occur in bays and in harbors. You have uh, the flood current, which is when the tide is, is crested. You have what's known as ebb current, which is when it's at its lowest point, and then slack water, is the time when there's no water moving in or out of the bay or, har or harbor. So when the highest amount of water is in the bay or harbor, you're at a flood current. When the lowest amount, you're at an ebb current. And when you're in between, it's called slack water. So here's some interesting ocean basins uh, and some interesting tidal shapes. So uh, if you look at the open ocean on the left uh, with a, um, an AP right in the middle of the basin, the water moves into the basin, deflected to the right, strikes the coastline on the east side, and then just travels around that coastline, um, taking 10, 12 hours to occur. You have a similar situation that occurs um, up in the, uh, the Canadian Maritime provinces, um, but the islands and, and the shapes of the coastline deflect and change those tides, and so it's not exactly the equilibrium theory. Here you have to take into account the dynamic theory. So. This uh, tidal range is determined by the basin configuration. So the imaginary AP system in a broad shallow basin, the numbers indicate the hourly position of the tide crest as the cycle progresses. The AP system for the Gulf of St. Lawrence, again, which is the Canadian Maritimes, between New Brunswick and Newfoundland, southeastern Canada, the dashed line shows the tide heights when the tide is, is passing. So um, you get some pretty significant tide heights moving through this basin because it's enclosed, you have different unusual and unique shapes. And if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, the Bay of Fundy is a, uh, a tidal bay that has one of the largest tidal ranges in the world, where, where there's literally 20 or 30 feet of tidal range that occurs. So in a narrow basin, like uh, you see in that A, there's no AP system. There's really no AP uh, because it's so narrow, so there's no space for rotation. So as we see, like in the Bay of Fundy, the water just comes straight in and then goes straight back out. And uh, it creates essentially a seas where water rushes up and water rushes down. And you can see there's like a 15 meter tidal range in the Bay of Fundy. Now we are going to talk about tidal patterns and how they affect marine organisms. And within that intertidal zone, the zone where the tide goes from low to high tide, 
organisms are exposed to varying amounts of emergence and submergence under the water. And so it has a dramatic effect on the type of organisms that can live there, like the grunion, which is a small fish. They time their reproductive behavior to precisely coincide with the tidal cycle so they can get up on shore uh, during very, very low tide and lay their eggs right on shore. And if you ever heard the grunion run in California, these fish flop up on shore right at the edge of the water and literally lay their eggs in the sand and then as the, as the water rushes back up, so they do it at the lowest tide of the season, and the water comes back up, it covers the fish eggs in water, and then the baby eggs, or the baby fish hatch out of those eggs when it's underwater and swim off. And that's the grunion run, and these grunion can time their laying of their eggs precisely to the lowest low tide of the season. And of course, there are lots of other uh, creatures that you find in what are known as tide pools, pools of water that are left behind as tides go up and down and uh, always find a way to the tide pools and find the urchins and the crabs and the different things, you know, the uh, sea anemone, maybe even the sea cucumbers that you can find in tidal pools. So we also want to talk a little bit about the power that can be extracted from tidal motion. Um, trapped high tide water can be generated to use electricity. So the tide comes in, so it goes up. It's going up slope. It's being pushed up slope. And so the force of gravity is going to pull it back down as the tide goes low. And we can use that force of gravity and water to create electricity. And the first major tidal power station was opened back in 1966. We've also seen them in South Korea. Essentially, they submerged turbines in open water to allow the, the, the tide pushing back and forth, as they did in Northern Ireland, to drive those turbines. So there are some very exciting possibilities with tidal power. They have very low operating costs. And of course, it's a free power source. Now, the low operating cost is to operate the machinery to build it, to put it in place, that can be expensive. Uh, the biggest disadvantage of tidal power is that even if you built stations in every place in the world where you could use them, you probably would only generate about 1% of the current world needs of energy. So it's not necessarily a worldwide solution uh, to, to power generation, although it may be one solution. And next, as we make our way through the world of oceanography, we're going to begin to talk about coastlines and coastal processes and the different processes that actually can shape our coastlines and what they can tell us about the recent past and the distant past and talk a little bit about sea level rise as well.